So I had uh, studied physics at the University of British Columbia and then did a master's degree in low temperature physics, but always intending to be a teacher of some kind, either a high school teacher of physics or after I got my master's degree in a college somewhere. And then my wife and I went overseas uh, with the Canadian Peace Corps and taught school in Zambia. Zambia had just become independent in 1964. We were there in 1966, so it was soon after independence. And I had a, a wonderful three-year stint uh, working in a high school for Jesuit priests. It was a mission school. We were very successful. We had, did a lot of scientific things. And I came to the notice of the Dean of Science at the new University of Zambia, <coughs> such that when we finished our three-year contract, he offered me a position at the University of Zambia to lecture physics. And uh, it was a wonderful job. I had to teach the freshman or the first year course in physics. I had to counsel the students who weren't used to all the freedoms they had in university. And basically in one year, make university students out of these entering students. The next step is one of serendipity because a professor from the University of Michigan called Henry Pollock and his family came out to Zambia on sabbatical leave to do two things, to teach a year of geophysics and to advise the university and the government of setting up a geophysics unit at the new University of Zambia. And within either hours or days, I liked this man. So before I had even read anything about geophysics, I was out in a Land Rover on the weekends making gravity measurements, making temperature measurements, and so forth. And, and so I, I fell into geophysics. And, and it was almost love at first sight. I, I loved what we were doing. We were making measurements, physical measurements that I could understand. I mean, geophysics just seemed to be there waiting for me. So that was a for very fortunate part. And I followed him to Ann Arbor and uh, worked on my PhD there, and then uh, moved to the University of Utah for my career. Students seem to have the idea, at least reflected in some of their questions, that I had my career all planned out. And they're very surprised when I say there were maybe 10 to 20 years in the early part of my career where I could not say at the beginning of one year exactly what I'd be doing two years hence. Over these 10 to 20 years, it was basically just keeping my options open, opening doors or having doors open for me, not being afraid to walk through the doors, and, and then just turning them into something else. And I always felt that if, if things didn't work out, I could go back through the door and try another door. So my wife and I are both sort of ecologically minded. Uh, before it was popular, we redid our garage on our house and put on solar panels. And when we found after the first year that we produced 80% of the, the power that we needed in the house, you could have added another 20% solar panels, but we jointly decided that we would cut down our energy usage by 20%. So for the last five years when we were in Utah, we produced 100% of our solar power on our, on our garage roof. So when, when I had done work in, in geothermics, started out just basically geothermics of, or heat flow of, of tectonic regions. So we were in the middle of the Basin Range in Western North America and the Colorado Plateau. So we were studying the difference between those two. <laughs> uh, then I had some students who worked on uplift of mountain ranges and exhumation, which is important. Uh, and then geothermal energy became very important in the 70s and early 80s. So we worked on geothermal exploration for geothermal systems. <clears throat> that introduced me to groundwater because geothermal systems are all to do with groundwater. So I had an excursion into, into groundwater. And then more lately, then uh, we 
along with many other people who did borehole temperature measurements, transitioned into realizing that there's a, a, a climate signal in borehole temperatures. So starting in about mid-1990s, <coughs> then I, I worked on borehole temperature change. And that brought together basically a lifestyle of, of wanting to be more ecologically minded with my teaching and my research. <coughs> and, and that's what I look back on in the last 20 years of my career. For a professor, one of the best things that can happen to you is to get good graduate students. So I, I was very fortunate that I've had about between 30 and 40 graduate students over a 40 year career. And they've been just some very extraordinary students. So I've always had three to five graduate students typically, uh, and maybe a postdoc here and there, but not not a big group, but I've always maintained a lab where we've had a big table and in all of my teaching positions and my university administrative positions, I always had lunch in the lab with the graduate students. And we had a group that we called ourselves the Friends of Lord Kelvin in appreciation for Lord Kelvin's you know, contribution as a, as a thermal physicist. And we were known in the department as you know, the Friends of Lord Kelvin's and other people would come in and have lunch with us. And during these lunches, we'd pose questions for students. And one of the things I picked up from recruiters that have come around to, to talk to our students is that they say there's the students are technically very well prepared now. They're all computer literate. They're very good at, at computer programming, at coding, etc. Uh, they're good technically in their subject. They understand geophysics. They're good mathematically. They're missing. If there's a weakness, they're weak in two areas. One is in in team work, and the other one is in communication skills. So this Friends of Lord Kelvin is an attempt to promote the idea of teams that you rarely are going to work in, in solitary confinement in your career. And working in teams and being able to communicate and contribute to teamwork is really important. And then uh, having communication skills is, is also really important. The field for me, being an experimental a uh, heat flow person and making measurements in, in drill holes and, and so forth has meant that it's been a nice combination of office work, lab work, and field work. And I wouldn't take back any of that. I just, I just have so much value being out in the field, sleeping in a tent at a borehole site, you know, watching the stars come up at night, and, and then talking to students and interacting with them about, about these things, about life in general. And, and, and how to proceed in, in life. So uh, you might be getting the view that I'm kind of student-centric, and that would be true. I did have an opportunity mid-career to uh, go back to Canada, where I was born, and I always viewed I would do at some point for a, a research job in the Pacific Geoscience Center in Vancouver Island. So I. I took a year off from the university, we would say a, a leave without pay, and I was hired by the Geological Survey of Canada for a year. But within months, I missed my graduate students. I uh, had arranged to go back to Salt Lake City once every semester. And what I found out is that the complaint of, of quite a few scientists that they get interrupted by students all the time wasn't my problem. I, I, in fact, worried about just sitting in my office doing my research and then found that I was not driven by my personal research so much as my doing my research with my students and through my students. So as I approached this week of going back to to work with students. You know, my adrenaline started going up. I, I flew in, got off the plane. I was met by my students. We'd go to a pub and, and we'd spend three or four days just nonstop talking and communicating about doing science. And I'd come back exhausted to do kind of solitary research again. 
So that might not be true of every one of my colleagues who, who want to spend more time doing science, but I've always wanted to do science and, and communicate with students at the same time. Working on real, real interesting problems drives us. And that's been the case, whether it's uh, working on the maturation of oil and gas in sedimentary basins, whether it's uh, working on hydrothermal circulation on the seafloor, whether it's working on climate change from boreal temperatures. Uh, the themes have changed through time. Uh, Unfortunately, in the United States, they're driven by funding opportunities more than one would like. But uh, that's not all, altogether bad, is to find out what you can do to contribute to going forward with research. And then having research over the last 20 years, being focused on climate change, and then my lecturing within the university and around the country and in places around the world on climate change has been very, very rewarding. I, I had a plan to come to the Potsdam meeting and uh, fade away into the sunset. But I have to say I've been absolutely re-energized in, in meeting the next generation of, of heat flow workers and students. It's given me a big adrenaline push and I've taken on some assignments that I didn't anticipate taking on. And uh, I want to thank uh, thank the meeting organizers for re-energizing me.